so in the last video, we were uh, talking about what object-oriented programming is uh, and how we might go about implementing a class in processing. Uh, in this video, I'd like to actually start implementing that bouncing ball class. Um, so let's get into it. So I have a, uh, an empty uh, processing sketch. Basically, I've only got the, uh, the window running and uh, the background of, of gray, uh, as usual. But so when we create a class, uh, we're going to want to create a new tab so we can put all the code for that class in a separate file. So we can go up here to the, um, that little arrow key and you can hit new tab. And then we can just name it ball because that's what my class is going to be named. So here we are in a new file. Um, and to create a class, we're simply just going to say class and then the name of the class with some, uh, some brackets. Um, so this will be the ball class. And we're just going to teach processing what it means to be a ball and what does the ball have, what does the ball do. Because um, those are really the, the, the two core pieces of object-oriented programming. Uh, and the two core pieces of an object itself. Objects are able to do things and they have things. So the having is like you have attributes. Like as a human, you have a height, you have a weight, you have an eye color. Uh, and as a human, you are also able to do things. So you can eat, and you can run. And those things are sort of like functions in programming. Um, so let's think about it. What does the ball actually have? So when we were creating a single bouncing ball, we had an x position and a y position, and we also needed x velocity and a y velocity uh, to keep track of how that ball was moving over time. So we, just like we did before with float x and y and float vel, vel x and vel y, we can just put those uh, declarations up here within the class. So we can say float x y and vel x and vel y. So that's what the ball actually has, right? So now let's think about what does it actually do. So previously, we would display the ball by drawing an ellipse. So the ball needs to know how to display itself. We also changed the x and y position of the ball by its velocity every frame. So the ball needs to know some way to move itself, right? Those are two pretty good abstractions, I think, that we can use for, um, for what the ball knows how to do. So to create those functions, uh, we can just add them in here down in the ball class. And they're both going to be void functions, which just means that they don't return anything, but that's not super important. So we can say avoid display, because the ball knows how to uh, display itself by drawing an ellipse. The ball displays itself. And similarly, we can say void move, because the ball needs to know how to uh, move. Right, so the ball changes its position. So cool. This is basically the outline of what the ball class is. What does it have? It has an x, a y, a bell x, and a bell y, and it knows how to display itself. And there's one other thing that we need to teach um, the ball class how to do, and it's called a constructor. And it looks a bit like this. So you say ball, just like a function, except there's no void or anything. Uh, and what a constructor does is it just tells processing, how do we create a new instance of the ball class? So for instance, I'm a human. Uh, I am the Thomas instance of a human. There are other humans. We're all sort of from the same cookie cutter human mold, like as a species, but we're all different instances, right? So, so this teaches it how to create an instance. So when we, were, uh, when we were starting off with the bouncing ball, we randomized, or we set the x and y position, uh, and we set the velocity and the y velocity. So we want to do that here in the constructor. So the way we can access these variables is by saying this.x equals 200, for, for, for instance. Um, and the reason we have this this dot is because that's saying, I want to refer to this instance of the ball, um, this ball's x value, uh, instead of referencing some global x variable that everyone can look at. It's talking specifically about the x variable for this ball. Um, so instead of setting it to 200, why don't we just give it a random value um, somewhere within the window, so from 0 to width. Um, we can do a similar thing for the y. Why not? Random 0 to height. And then for our velocities, right, so this is a random starting, whoops, starting position. And then for our velocities, we can do a similar thing. Uh, and I'll just allow it to be negative or positive, so we can say uh, maybe negative 7 to 7. So the y equals random, same thing, negative 7 to 7. So this will be a random starting velocity. I really cannot type today. So, we have started off um, the attributes of the ball within the ball's constructor. Uh, that's exactly what it needs to do. Now let's think about how we can actually display the ball. Well, we did that by drawing an ellipse, right? So we can just call it ellipse, and where is it going to be drawn? Well, it's going to be drawn at this dot x, right? And this dot y, which 
talking about this specific ball when it needs to play itself. And let's just make them all uh, 20 wide, 20 out. So cool. It knows how to display itself. Now, we need to teach it how to move, right? So moving involves adding the velocity to the value of each uh, position variable, right? So this dot x, just like we did before, is going to be itself plus the uh, velocity x, right? And same thing for the y. Just going to be this dot y plus oh, this dot vel y. So we're moving move the uh, ball by its velocity. That's how it moves. And then we also need to prevent the ball from going off the screen, right? So we need to have our, our checks for the edges uh, for, for the ball going off the window in here in the move function, right? So after we've moved the ball by its velocity, we're going to say if this dot x is less than zero, or this dot x is greater than width, right? Then we're going to say this dot del x equals this dot del x just times negative one. So we're flipping around the x velocity if we reach one of the bounds of the window so that it turns around and looks like a bounce off the wall, right? Oops, and then I forgot to close my brace. And then same thing for the y. If this dot y is less than zero, so off the top of the screen, or if this dot y is greater than the height of the screen, we also want to flip around the y direction. So that's all fine and dandy. And if, if you need a little bit of a refresher on this, you can go back to the original bouncing ball video where I talk more in depth about how we actually reach these, uh, these boundaries and whatnot. But um, this is basically bouncing off the top and bottom. And this is bouncing So, perfect. So now we basically have this class written uh, of, of what it means to be a ball. So we, we know that the ball has an x position, a y position, and an x velocity and a y velocity. Uh, it knows how to construct itself, where when it constructs itself, it's giving itself a random x and a random y, and also a random velocity x and a random velocity y. It knows how to display itself simply by drawing an ellipse at its own x and y position. And it knows how to move by adding the velocity to its x and y position and then checking for the boundaries of the window so that it knows when to bounce. So this is all the information that we had from last time about what it means to be a bouncing ball, except now it's encoded nicely in this, uh, this whole class, which gives us sort of a cookie cutter that we're able to use to create many, many instances of this type of data, which is a ball, right? So in the next video, we're going to go over actually using this class to create new instances of a ball, uh, and then we can experiment with what that looks like. So I hope to see you then.